brain health, mental health, neurodivergent stuff is all over YouTube, all over TikTok, all over literally anywhere I look online. Habit building, healthy lifestyles, productivity, and learning lots of different things in general is also all over the internet. And I would like to use the advice, the tips and tricks that are given that are backed by research, not just by some anecdotal experience. But I don't really know how we study the brain, so I don't know what's right, wrong, true, not true. So I went to find out. My initial thinking was is just psychologists, but actually psychologists are part of cognitive science. So this small research project of just having a look at psychologists actually became quite large because now I'm looking at the entirety of cognitive science. As I knew from my A-level PE days, we used to follow behaviorism and, and following conditioning and behaviors and that's how the brain worked. But as I'm guessing you know, and I knew before even going into this, we can't explain all of our brain's processes through behavior because like consciousness, mental states, like those those are real things. After doing a lot of online reading, I decided to get a, 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 light, a light book to help me understand all of this stuff around cognitive psychology. So I can now split up the approaches to human cognition into four main areas. We've got cognitive psychology, cognitive neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, and computational cognitive science. Cognitive psychology is kind of where I thought all of the approaches to human cognition were sort of just in, and then the, the neuroimaging stuff was sort of just part of psychology, but that's not true. Cognitive psychology looks at the internal processes that happen in our brain and does that via observing behaviours in cognitive tasks instead of a lab or somewhere for testing. And even though this entire book is supposedly about cognitive psychology, the only strengths are really that cognitive psychology has led to other approaches to human cognition from a research approach perspective anyway. And the reasons is because there are quite a few limitations to the way cognitive psychology works from a, a research perspective. It is low in ecological validity, which basically means, is it real life? Does it represent real life? Do these theories represent real life? And because cognitive psychology is uh, in a lab, it's very specific in a lab, observing a specific behavior outside of all the other stuff, well, that's not representative of everyday life. The theories are also verbally expressed, like there's no quantitative, yeah, this is exactly what happened. They're just expressed theories, which makes it very difficult to falsify. Which is why in some areas of cognitive psychology, you can have lots of theories trying to explain the exact same idea and no one's wrong, but no one's right either. And because of this fairly narrow view of testing, looking for specific behaviors in certain environments and tests, it means a lot of the results are very, very specific and hard to apply to everyone in everyday life. Again, leading back to the ecological validity argument. This isn't to say cognitive psychology is a bad approach to studying human cognition and the way the brain works or the mind works, but that there are limitations in the way that they find answers. Cognitive neuropsychology takes a different approach and instead of looks at observing behaviors, it looks at brain damaged patients. In a nutshell, they look at someone that has a brain and someone that has a damaged brain and says, okay, that damaged part of the brain, what does it stop, inhibit, or hinder you from doing? There are a few assumptions in cognitive neuropsychology, three of them being main assumptions that you really need to follow to find any answers. But as soon as I heard the three assumptions, I was like, hmm, I don't know about that. The first one is modularity. So we have modules in our brain that build up our brain. We have certain parts that build up the brain. The second is anatomical modularity, which means those modules, those parts of the brain are organized in a certain way in the brain. And then universality, so that organization, the anatomical organization of the parts in the brain is universal across other people. And the word neurodivergence screams at me right now. When I hear these assumptions, I'm thinking, well, if everyone's slightly different, how can these assumptions be true? The research methods have changed over time. They've gone from individuals with certain issues and then groups of people that have similar issues looking for disassociations and the methods have changed and evolved and will constantly change and evolve. But I'm still not sure about the assumptions that this whole approach is built from. Yes, we can create causal inferences between brain areas and cognitive processing if you're expecting the brain to be active and it's not because it's damaged and you can't do something. Well, oh, there must be a relation there. But the assumption of modularity doesn't seem to be true for the higher levels of processing like 
consciousness focused attention or the flow state or anything like that. The universality assumption has contradicting evidence and some of the obvious ones is the compensating strategies that we use when we do have brain damage. A perfect example of this is a hemispherectomy. Basically, when we learn to speak, we speak typically from the left side of our brain. A hemispherectomy gets rid of the left side of the brain, surgically removed for whatever medical reason, but those people that have a hemispherectomy, how many times can I say that, um, they, the language and talking stuff goes to the right side of the brain. So what's typically in the left is now in the right. So our brain has compensated, which means universality can't be true because, well, the people with no left side of the brain can still do stuff that should be in the left side of the brain. So <laughs> it's, it's not universal. <laughs> and then another assumption about these modules is that, well, if a module is damaged, well, it's just that function that's damaged. But we don't really know that's true because brain damage could also cause global functional issues not just module-specific issues. But having said all of those somewhat negative things about cognitive neuropsychology, brain damage and using brain damaged individuals to rule things out or prove things true or false is certainly useful. Moving on to neuroscience, this is where I thought, okay, this is, this is where all of the, the cognitive science brain stuff answers comes from. Uh, I mean, you got Andrew Huberman, he's a neuroscientist, he, he seems to know a lot. But it uses behavioral observation, just like cognitive psychology, and neuroimaging. So essentially, the only real difference between neuroscience and cognitive psychology that I could find is they map the brain using neuroimaging, which is creating this connectome of, of parts and connections between other parts inside of the brain that we can't really see or prove or falsify. Neuroscience, or neuroimaging, brings in lots of information into cognitive science research. But note I say information, not necessarily answers. Some of the cognitive theories from cognitive psychology have been shown to be oversimplified because of the neuroimaging information. The idea of functional specialization was shown to be oversimplified, which is the idea that you have a specific area of the brain that does a certain function. Well, neuroimaging shows that actually that's not quite true. Simply put, they do a test. The imaging says, yes, you're right. They go, okay, this means this. So we have the result, we have an answer. This must be true. But that doesn't mean it's telling the whole story. One to one isn't always true. Maybe it's one to two. Maybe there's more things going on. In this book, they use the fusiform as an example. It was thought, because of neuroimaging, that the fusiform was for facial recognition. And that's not wrong. But it's not entirely right either. The fusiform is actually active in object recognition. So it was oversimplified because the one-to-one -one relation between result and answer was just, oh yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, it is, but it's also oversimplified. So the neuroimaging in neuroscience gives lots of information, but it gives information for interpretations for answers rather than answers themselves. It seems that a lot of these neuroscience studies don't test cognitive theories themselves, they look at specific brain regions, like local brain regions, and look for processing or brain activation. But as we've just discussed, brain activation and psychological processes are not a one-to-one -one relation. It doesn't just mean, yeah, that's right, that's true. There's interpretation and there's oversimplification that could be happening. A meta-analysis that I found found that replication of neuroscience studies is very difficult, ranging between 14 and 51% of accuracy of replication, which is not ideal. <laughs> Ideally you want like 100% reproducibility. False positives also seem to be quite common. Uh, oh, and there was, a, there was an example in the book that <laughs> it made me giggle. They found brain activation during a test which looked really positive in a dead fish. They found brain activation in a dead fish. So if they hadn't looked twice, they would have shown that a certain part of the brain is active for a cognitive task in a dead fish. <laughs> I'm not saying neuroimaging is really unreliable, I'm just saying there are cases where it is unreliable and false positives actually seem to be quite common, especially when you're looking at specific parts of the brain. On top of that, research often reveals associations, which is correlational, not causational, again, thinking about information rather than answers. Ecological validity is still an issue because you don't go walking around your day with, a, with an MRI machine over your head or, or anything else that's going on, like you just move around your day. It's very hard to get a, a real life, everyday life scanning of your brain at the moment. A word that I first came across in the book, but then in other papers, other meta-analysis and other debates going backwards and forwards between academics is neuroenchantment. 
basically us overemphasizing neuroimaging. Yeah, look at this new result. This is the, the next big thing. But it's just information. It's not necessarily an answer to a question that we need. I did look into quite a few different types of neuroimaging, all with varying degrees of spatial and temporal resolution, which is basically the precision of the, the brain area and then the timing of the activation of the brain pulses. Each method's with pros and cons, but all of them still under the limitations of cognitive neuroscience. Now we have behavioral observations, testing brain damaged individuals using neuroimaging scans. The next thing obviously is using computers and AI algorithms. But not quite, because computational cognitive science, yes, uses algorithms, but it's not like AI. What this approach tries to do is map brain processes, whatever processes means, uh, into an algorithm. But a computer, an AI computer, doesn't think the same way a human does. The way I think of this and the way I remember this is thinking about a chess computer and a chess GM or Grandmaster. When you have a computer, they're going to look at every single possible move, look at all the good moves, look at all the bad moves, have a value, and then figure out which move is the best to play. Whereas a, a person isn't going to look at every single move because <laughs> they don't have the brain power to look at every possible move available. They look at the most likely or the, the, the best looking options, so they're not quite as good because a computer is looking at everything, whereas a human is limiting their views. However, that's a closed environment, so chess has rules, you can only do certain things. In an open environment, a computer, that there's just far too many things for them to look at. So they overlook some of the small nuances and inter interpretations that humans have, which I shared in my notes all over, but humans have these small nuanced interpretations of information because we can narrow down our views. And the biggest supercomputer in the world still can't process as much information as a human can when you look at the results a human gets. But when you constrain the environment and you look for a certain question, a certain answer, follow an algorithm, then a computer's better because it can look for but all the possible answers. So when these algorithms are created to try and map out how the human works, obviously it's going to be slightly oversimplified. Maybe inaccurate, because we need to oversimplify it in order to understand what it, what it is that we're doing. So the algorithms are great for linking some of the neuroimaging results and, and bringing together some of the cognitive theories there to give us an idea of what's going on in the brain. But as the Benini, Benoni, as the paradox says, Easily understood algorithms and models are often oversimplified or incomplete, and the more accurate they get, the more complex they get, the harder it is for us to understand, and sort of defeats the point of creating the algorithm in the first place if we're just representing what we're doing anyway. And in a related way, the more complex the algorithm gets, the harder it is to falsify it because the harder it is to consider all of the different possibilities that's going on. And then I found out that, well, th this kind of blew my mind, but they don't consider motivation or emotion in the models. So the algorithms to represent cognition don't consider motivation or, or emotions, which Humans do. We, we always think with emotions and motivation and, and, and these things obviously impact how we think, why we think, or the way that we think. It's just, how can you not include that? Obviously, it's very complicated, but it's just... Grrr. So we create cognitive theories, we then test it with brain damaged individuals, sort of. We then look at neuroimaging and mapping out the brain that gives us information, but no real answers. And then we try and give it an algorithm that doesn't really apply to us because it's oversimplified. So obviously all of these conclusions require interpretation because it's information that requires individuals to have knowledge and understanding, deep understanding of what this information means and how it can apply in different fields, in different contexts, in different nuances, because that's taken out of the way that we study the brain. It's all the tips, tricks, hacks, and, and solutions to behavior and mental health and brain health and do this, that, and the other is, is, is all based on correlational research from what I can see, which doesn't seem to be very useful if anything, it's oversimplified, just like the research is. Of course, when you research, it leaves you with more questions than answers, which I was expecting anyway, but it does mean that when I'm looking at any of these resources around anything to do with the brain, psychology, cognitive psychology, or ecological psychology, which is something I'm really interested in, nuance and context is extremely important, and if someone doesn't explain the nuance or context they're talking about the information in, then I immediately don't trust what it is that they're saying. Or at least want to question it a little bit.
A link to my notes and all of the sources I've discussed in this video are in the description below.